do you think we'll ever be able to travel to the moon the way we travel across the country on trains? Definitely. Although not for another 84 years, not on trains. We'll have space vehicles, capsules, settle off, rockets, devices that create giant explosions. Explosions so powerful that they just... They break the pull of the Earth's gravity and send the projectile through outer space. Damn it. I read that book, too. You're, you're quoting Jules Verne from the Earth to the Moon. You read Jules Verne. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. Which came first, the science or the fiction? We're all familiar with the phrase, life imitates art, but it's quite astounding to learn just how spectacularly this seems to have borne itself out when it comes to the way that science fiction has managed to predict so many aspects of space travel, which supposedly eventually came to pass. I was quite amazed when I first heard that science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke actually wrote about the concept of geostationary satellites before they were ever built or tested by actual rocket scientists. But I was even more amazed to later learn that this is only partially true. Clark was the first to write about the idea of using satellites for the purpose of telecommunications. The Brick Moon, a short story by Edward Everett Hale, was actually the first description of an artificial satellite, and it was published in the Atlantic Monthly starting in 1869. The book Edison's Conquest of Mars by Garrett P. Service describes spacesuits and airlocks in 1898. Most of us are quite familiar with the uncanny predictions of science fiction writers such as Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, and how these renowned writers and their fantastic imagination supposedly inspired the legitimate scientific development of space exploration in the future. However, when we take a closer look at many of the specific plot points of Jules Verne's novel From the Earth to the Moon, the predictions almost begin to smack of plagiarism on the part of NASA. Verne wrote a story about the first manned spaceship in history, launched during the month of December by the United States from a base in Florida. The ship was made up mostly of aluminum, weighed 19,250 pounds, and cost what would now be about 12.1 billion to build. After three of the astronauts completed their moonwalk, they returned to Earth. Their capsule splashed down into the Pacific Ocean and was recovered by a U.S. Navy vessel. He published this in 1865, and being more than a hundred years before the Apollo 11 mission, Verne's novel From the Earth to the Moon actually serves as a bizarrely accurate novelization of that mission. He was slightly off on the cost and weight of the rocket. The real stats were about 26,000 pounds and 14.4 billion, and the biggest difference between Verne and NASA was that Verne's astronauts were shot out of a huge cannon. But get this, Verne's space cannon was called Columbiad, and the Apollo 11 command module was named Columbia. But moving into the 20th century, science fiction authors such as Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Carl Sagan began to readily accept their titles as prophets of the future, and embraced the role of basically serving as spokesmen for all the magnificent technological marvels that had already unfolded and would yet to unfold to know with any certainty what's likely to happen in the more distant future. 
In 1945, one man with remarkable foresight published a paper suggesting the use of communication satellites on exactly the same system now being planned. Horizon filmed him at the World's Fair in New York. He's Arthur Clarke. Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation because the prophet invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that in 20 or at most 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. On the other hand, if by some miracle a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everybody would laugh him to scorn. This has proved to be true in the past, and it will undoubtedly be true, even more so, of the century to come. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So, if what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll have failed completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. Gene Roddenberry and his Star Trek franchise is of course also credited greatly with inspiring an entire generation to grow up and turn their dreams of space travel into reality by joining NASA. So, where to begin? Well, Star Trek was about nothing, really, if it wasn't about space. But in the 1960s, space travel was a lot less glamorous than it seemed on our show. In fact, it was a messy and dangerous business. The Soviet, Yuri Gagarin, became the first man in space in 1961. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Now, the space race was officially on. The newly formed NASA responded by sending the first Americans into space during the Mercury missions. NASA needed all the help it could get. And then, from the heavens, or at least the studios of NBC, came the inspiration they needed. On September 8, 1966, the USS Enterprise cruised effortlessly across the television screens of America for the first time. Audiences were astonished and inspired. And not just by my acting, but by a vision of space travel as it could one day be. Soon Star Trek would become NASA's inspiration, guiding the development of space travel to this very day. Well, I've been interested in space and science literally for as long as I can remember. I have a vague recollection of walking into the living room when I was maybe five or so and my father was watching TV and I said, what are you watching? And he said, they're going to send a man into space. And that must have been one of the early Mercury flights. And I was, I was thrilled with that then and I've, I've stayed fascinated with the exploration of space my whole life. But it wasn't just TV images of man's first faltering steps into space that captured young Mark's imagination. Changing channels, he saw a life-altering vision of space travel's future, a future he could be part of. Captain, sensors report we're being scanned. As soon as I began watching Star Trek, I was captivated by it. By the alien ship? No, sir, it's from that solar system ahead. In Star Trek, regular people could go throughout the galaxy Whereas the reality at the time was a few very special men got to make very short trips just a hundred or so miles away from Earth. And so Star Trek really offered a vision of what could be, and that was very exciting. And again, it was a vision that people wanted to believe was real. It would appear as someone is curious about it. Dawn will be the latest probe to use ion propulsion, a revolutionary new system that uses electrically charged atomic particles as fuel, propelling crafts ten times faster than if they used regular old-fashioned rocket fuel. Sounds pretty cool. Guess where they got the idea from? Hmm? I worked on a mission called Deep Space One, which was the first interplanetary mission to use ion propulsion to travel around the solar system. And the first time I ever heard of ion propulsion was in the Star Trek episode, Spock's Brain. Aliens come to the Enterprise, and before they do their dastardly deed, Kirk walks over to Spock and says, Have you read, Mr. Spock? Configuration unidentified, ion propulsion, high velocity, though of a unique technology. 
And Scotty says, I've never seen anything like it. And ion propulsion at that. Oh, they could teach us a thing or two. And so the opportunity to connect what I saw in Star Trek as a little kid to what I'm doing now as an adult is very, very... Truly amazing, isn't it? Everything from space capsules to spacesuits, geostationary satellites to multi-stage rockets, zero gravity to space shuttles, lunar landers, and even ion propulsion systems, all predicted with stunning accuracy by the creative minds of science fiction writers. <laughs>